We're so pleased that you all joined us tonight in what is sure to be a provocative and challenging debate over a question that is central to our upcoming presidential election. Is Christianity good for American politics? I'm Jeff Seaver, Executive Director of the Center for Inquiries Michigan Branch, which is one of three partnering organizations responsible for bringing you tonight's event. We've been thrilled to work closely with the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University and the Intercollegiate Studies Institute based in Wilmington, Delaware. CFI and the Howenstein Center are especially grateful to ISI for proposing this event and for providing significant underwriting to make it possible. All three partners have in common a commitment to education, ethics, freedom, and to encouraging open dialogue about politics, religion, and other issues at the core of understanding what it means to be an American. The Center for Inquiries mission is to foster a secular society based on science, reason, freedom of inquiry, and humanist values. The Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies is dedicated to raising a community of ethical and effective leaders for the 21st century. The mission of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute is educating for liberty by inspiring college students to discover, embrace, and advance the principles and virtues that make America free and prosperous. I'd also like to acknowledge Fountain Street Church and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation for their support for our evening together. Now, please welcome Gleaves Whitney, director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies, who will be introducing our guests and moderating tonight's debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, you've uh, made a nice introduction to the evening. We're going to have a very exciting evening. We appreciate your partnership, Jeff, and we indeed appreciate all the partners that we have who helped make this event happen tonight. Well, this evening we're going to do something that's very American. We're going to have a rousing debate about the role of religion in public life, the meaning of the First Amendment, and the cultural consequences of freedom of conscience to our political order and our civil society. It's a debate that goes back to the origins of our nation and to the founding generation. And if you juxtapose, say, Jefferson with uh, Hamilton, Adams and Payne, Madison and Witherspoon, you get an idea of the competing visions for ordered liberty in our civil polity at the beginning of the Republic. Well, there's no lack of competing visions 220 years later, as you know, with us to explore the debate, uh, the perennial questions that swirl about religion and public life, are two renowned thinkers and speakers whom we are delighted to host this evening. Both of them hail from New York City, and perhaps there's where most similarity ends. <laughs> Susan Jacoby is an independent scholar whose interest in intellectual history has generated 10 books. She is perhaps best known for Freethinkers, a history of American secularism, which came out in 2004 and was cited as one of the most significant international books when it came out. She's also written Age of American Unreason, which was a New York Times bestseller, Wild Justice, the Evolution of Revenge, which was a Pulitzer finalist, and Never Say Die, the Myth and Marketing of the New Old Age. Also on a more personal note, she wrote Half Jew, a Daughter's Search for Her Family's Buried Past. She also had a weekly column called The Spirited Atheist, which was hosted by the Washington Post for a number of years. Ms. Jacoby has been the recipient of numerous prestigious grants and awards from the Guggenheim, Rockefeller, and Ford Foundations, as well as from the National Endowment for the Humanities. She also has Michigan roots. Uh, talking to her earlier today, I found out that she uh, was born and raised, or raised in Okemos, Michigan, and uh, she went to Michigan State University, graduated from there in 1965. Please give, <laughs> go green, I heard, Please give Susan Jacoby a warm Michigan welcome.
Dinesh D'Souza is a New York Times best-selling author and the president of the King's College, a Christian college located in the Empire State Building, has three floors in that building. He has been called one of the top young public policymakers in the country by Investors Business Daily. The New York Times Magazine named him one of America's most influential conservative thinkers. After serving in the Reagan administration, Mr. D'Souza wrote a series of bestsellers, including Illiberal Education, The End of Racism, Ronald Reagan, What's So Great About America, What's So Great About Christianity, Life After Death, and most recently, The Roots of Obama's Rage. By the way, yesterday was Mr. D'Souza's birthday. Please welcome Dinesh D'Souza. By prior agreement, the format is as follows. Each debater will make an opening statement. Each will field three questions put by the moderator. Each will have the opportunity to put a question to the other, and each has agreed to field questions from you. A coin toss determined who would get to go first, and Susan, you have five minutes to make your opening statement. Well, the half-Jewish side of me is going to answer the question framing tonight's debate with a question. What kind of Christianity are we talking about? Fundamentalist Protestant Christianity, which maintains that every word in the Bible is literally true, or mainstream to literal Protestantism, which regards the Bible as a man-written metaphor for spiritual truth? Are we talking about the conservative Catholicism of, say, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops? which considers contraception a mortal sin and women in the priesthood a heresy, or about the faith of the majority of lay American Catholics and nuns who reject the notion that a select group of old men can lay exclusive claim to divine authority. Are we talking about the kind of Christian politicians who today use the phrase Judeo-Christian heritage at every opportunity, or about the kind of far-right Christians who are attached to the state of Israel primarily because the book of Revelation names that land as the site of Judgment Day, the day on which all Jews who haven't accepted Jesus as the Messiah are slated to disappear. You see the problem. The founders certainly did at a time when America was not only almost entirely Christian, but almost entirely Protestant. At the time the Constitution was written, every state except Rhode Island and Virginia had laws that privileged one religion over another. The Commonwealth of Rhode Island, as it happens, had been founded by religious dissidents, freeing the Puritan theocracy of the Massachusetts Bay Colony at a time in the mid-17th century when Massachusetts was actually executing Quakers. At the time of the Revolution, Protestants could run for office in Massachusetts, but not Jews and Catholics. The framers of the Constitution took a look at this sectarian strife, which had of course been imported from the old world, and decided that the national government was going to set a very different example for the states. So they left God out of the Constitution entirely, a decision that was debated thoroughly at every state ratifying convention. The purpose of omitting God from the Constitution and prohibiting the kinds of religious tests for public office that existed in the states was to protect government from undue religious influence. The purpose of the First Amendment, however, was to protect religion from government. Now, the Christian right today wants to erase the first half of that equation from American history. Since the day when the religious right lost its first battle over the godless constitution, they've never gotten over it. There were many attempts to insert a so-called Christian amendment into the constitution during the 19th century, most notably during the Civil War. We know that to this day, the proper distance between religion and government is a major political flashpoint, although I can't find anyone before Rick Santorum who became so agitated that the very phrase separation of church and state made him want to throw up. It's difficult to imagine what sort of America we would have today 
if the founders, instead of writing we the people, had written we the people in order to form a more perfect union with Christ as our Lord and Father, and in conjunction with the Father and the Holy Spirit. For one thing, this utterly gorgeous church, which I've never seen, might not be here, since the somewhat ambivalent relationship, shall we say, of many liberal Protestants since the Holy Trinity made a lot of congregationalists and Presbyterians angry right from the start. The separation of church and state emphatically does not mean the exclusion of voices of faith from the public square. What it does mean is that religious faith is not a sufficient argument to justify any other policy. Now, I was going to use environmentalism as an example of this, but I saw something even better and up to date on the television news, unusually both on Fox and MSNBC, before I came here tonight. Uh, Representative Paul Ryan, who is a Catholic, of course, was at Georgetown University defending, defending his budget and saying that, that what he said was is that uh, the preference for the poor in Catholicism doesn't mean preference for the state. And he also quoted Pope Benedict on the idea that it's not too good an idea for nations to roll up a lot of debt. Then on the other side, there, were, there was a signature, signatures by a whole bunch of Georgetown faculty members, many of them priests, uh, saying basically that, uh, that Jesus was in favor of the poor and that's why the Ryan budget is bad. Now what I'm here to say to you is that even though I might agree with the liberal Catholics and disagree with Paul Ryan, that neither of what they're citing from the Bible or from popes is a basis for public policy, which must always be determined by some sort of agreement among competing interests and a reasoned assessment of evidence of what works and, and what does not. I don't care what Pope Benedict says about, about about this, Ryan's budget, any more than I care about what the Bible says about it. If Christians cannot agree on what a particular biblical passage means as far as a modern political issue is concerned, why in heaven or to be more precise on earth should the Christian religion or any religion be the basis for political decisions? Jesus drove the money letters out of the, out of the temple. Should we therefore decide that charging interest ought to be prohibited? I have yet to see a candidate of the Christian right make that case. And by the way, I would say exactly the same thing about secular humanism or atheism as rationales for public policy. As an atheist in a secular humanism, I believe, for instance, in universal human rights as rights based simply on our common humanity. In the end, though, to make these rights a reality here on Earth, we have, we have to act on the basis of what is demonstrably good. Demonstrable not because some supernatural story said so, and not because Spinoza or Thomas Paine said so, but demonstrable because we can see the positive results before our eyes. So by all means, let us have all of the sometimes discordant, sometimes harmonious voices of faith and secular philosophy in the public square. But don't try to sell your politics to me with thus saith the Lord. Because isn't it astonishing that everyone who claims to have heard the voice of God throughout history, how much that voice of God sounds like our own voice and what we already believe. Thank you. Dinesh, you have five minutes opening statement. It's a real uh, thrill and an honor to be here. This is a beautiful uh, setting, and I'm thrilled to have really a first opportunity to uh, debate and exchange ideas with uh, Susan Jacoby. When I think about Western civilization, the civilization that America is a part of, uh, this civilization has two historical roots. Uh, the first is Athens, and the second is Jerusalem. Now, this is not a religious claim. It's a purely historical claim. Uh, historians will acknowledge that our civilization has been watered by Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, but it has also been fertilized by Moses and Abraham and Jesus. 
Now, the full significance of this doesn't often dawn on us because what it really means is that our core values, including the values that atheists cherish, are very often located in this, under these two pillars of Athens and Jerusalem. Our belief, for example, in universal compassion as a social value. There is no transaction of reason that dictates that we should care about somebody who's unrelated to us. However, here in the West, religious and non-religious people, we do. If there was a big famine in Haiti tomorrow, you'll notice that there would be a sort of yawning silence in most other cultures. The Chinese would ignore it, the Indians wouldn't care, the Muslim countries have plenty of oil money, but they would go about it as if nothing had happened. But here in the West, in America and Europe, the churches, Doctors Without Borders, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, we're all animated, we all want to do something, we feel bad. But we're responding ultimately because we are the products of a specific history and a specific culture. This is not a matter of whether or not Thomas Jefferson went to church uh, or whether or not Benjamin Franklin was an Orthodox Christian. It's a matter of recognizing that our core principles, even principles that we see as secular. Here's Thomas Jefferson. He was a man of the Enlightenment. He had a particularly, you may say, ambivalent relationship to the Bible, usually reading it accompanied by a pair of lengthy scissors, cutting out the miracles and so on. Sure. And yet when the founders basically said to Jefferson, you go into a room and sit down and tell us where these inalienable rights come from, Jefferson comes back and he doesn't say, well, they come from the social contract. No, they're inalienable because they come from our creator. We are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. So even Jefferson, when he sits down to it and thinks about human dignity and all the rights that come out of that, he can't think of some automatic transaction of reason, some Euclidean proposition, some so-called bogus syllogism that generates dignity. There is none. Dignity comes out of the idea that there is a transcendent element in humanity and Either you accept that or you don't. If you look at the great social movements of American politics, not only the movement that led to the founding, which was driven in part by the First Great Awakening, but the movements that led to the temperance movement, the uh, suffragette movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-slavery movement, they were not only waves of religious revival that often preceded and sometimes accompanied these movements, but the arguments in favor of these causes were made in explicitly religious terms. When Martin Luther King said, I'm submitting a promissory note, this was not a claim of reason. The Southerners could have said, what note? We didn't sign anything. What are you talking about? Martin Luther King was appealing ultimately to the Declaration of Independence, paradoxically a document signed by a Southern planter. King's argument is parasitic upon the religious underpinning of Jefferson's argument made 200 years earlier. So does it in the wake of all this even make any sense to talk about does Christianity have a role in American politics to, to turn Susan Jacoby's question on its head if you were to subtract the influence of Christianity from the West? What would be left? If you were to subtract it from America, no founding, no declaration of independence, no anti-slavery movement, uh, no civil rights movement. So the fact of the matter is that Christianity has had an incredibly powerful, and I would argue on the balance, powerfully positive role in shaping American life and American politics. Even the atheist is standing on a Christian mountain. When the atheist talks about science, we should not escape our attention that what we call science is a Western phenomenon. It developed in Western civilization and not in other cultures. Now, why is that? It developed because in the West, we have had this idea of the rational universe. And the rational universe, the idea that the universe operates according to laws, is an idea rooted both in Athens and in Jerusalem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, the first question, the origin and meaning of the term 
separation of church and state has become quite uh, controversial in today's polarized political environment. What does the term mean to you, and does it accurately reflect what you believe to be the proper role of religion in the public square? Dinesh. The term separation of church and state, or the idea of separation of church and state, is in fact an invention of Christianity. When Jesus was asked about the duties that we have to God and the emperor, he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Uh, so that this idea comes out of Christianity. We can test this by looking at other religions. In Islam, you have no such distinction. Now, I admit that in, in, in medieval history, this distinction was often contested, it was often blurred, but even in the times of the Inquisition, when church and state appeared to be one, the fact of the matter was that if you were ch charged with heresy, you were prosecuted by the church. If you were charged with murder, you were persecuted by the state. So this distinction is, in fact, invented by Christianity, and uh, it's, it's one of Christianity's gifts to Western civilization. What strikes me today is that we are victims of a particularly perverse reading of that phrase. Separation of church and state as it's interpreted today basically means this. We have believers and unbelievers, and we have a public square which is the shared democratic space of our society. So how, do, how are we fair to everybody? We essentially identify the public square, then we identify all religious monuments, propositions, and views. We kick them out of the public square. We expel them. We don't allow them in. And we turn over the public square entirely to the secularists and the atheists and give them, in effect, a monopoly on the public square. And in doing this, we have been marvelously fair to everybody. Well, this, of course, is sheer nonsense. The truth of the matter is that in a diverse society, believers and unbelievers have to learn to share the public square. And it's a little idiotic just for unbelievers to take their opinions and label them reason, and take the believers' opinions and label them unreason, and then declare them to be somehow excommunicate from the public square. That's something no church even would be so intolerant as to pretend to do. Uh, and so it seems to me that separation of church and state, in principle, a great idea. As it is enforced, it essentially makes religious believers of all stripes into second-class citizens. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I've read this in Mr. D'Souza's books already, and I find his interpretation of Jesus' famous statement quite astonishing. I, I hate to remind you, but Jesus was not making a pronouncement about separation of church and state. He was a Jew brought before a Ro Roman governor who suspected him of being an enemy of Rome. And he was speaking as a Jew, I would say, probably as one who really wasn't all that eager to die on the cross. He was saying, my kingdom is not of this world, which he also said on this event. He, he was not making a statement about whether theology should be written into law or whether the church should or should not uh, kill heretics. Uh, secondly, uh, to talk about the public square as, as one in which religious views are thrown out and secular views reign, it's a great example of the enormous success that the Christian right has had in painting itself as a victim. Uh, the fact is, in the public square, we have no shortage of all kinds of religious voices, as we have seen in the recent campaign. The question is not whether all voices belong in the public square, which is also here. But obviously, they do. The question is, we make our, if, do we make our laws on the basis of religious belief? Now, probably the, the most notable defender of the idea that we are a Christian nation and that all governmental power comes from God is Justice Antonin Scalia. And his argument in favor of the death penalty is quite simple. It is all governmental power derives from God. God has the power over life and death. Therefore, God's elected representatives also have the right to have the power over life and death. This is other nonsense. Uh, I ask you why 
if the founders of this country thought that, they didn't write God into the Constitution. No, we the people is very different from all power comes from God. We, everyone who believes in God and who is part of a religious tradition has the right to fully participate in the public square. Those of us who don't believe that laws, like for example laws allowing the death penalty, should be made on the basis of so-called sacred books written three to 5,000 years ago, or in the case of the Quran, 800 years ago, simply say, we could say, render unto, unto the government that which is the government's and unto God that which is God. So that is not at all the same thing as saying that God founded our country, all the power of our legislative leaders comes from God, therefore we make our laws according to religious belief. Thank you. You have a one minute rebuttal. It is the direct meaning of Jefferson's proposition that we are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights, that our rights do, in fact, from Jefferson's point of view, come from God. What is rather remarkable here is that Susan Jacoby is giving a very tendentious interpretation and pretending like it is the only way that reason can see the matter. Scalia is fundamentally right that the divine right of kings that applied in Europe was in fact transferred to America, but it wasn't divine right that was crossed out, it's the word king. What the founders did is they replaced the word kings with people. So in effect, we are under divine right even now, but it's the divine right transferred from the one, the monarch, to the people, us. That was the argument, the Christian argument for democracy. Now, you don't have to agree with it, but to pretend that it's somehow superstitious, it's devoid of reason, this is what really is very galling. Uh, Christians have a brain the same as Susan Jacoby. We can look at the historical facts the same as she can. We can interpret them perhaps differently, but why is our interpretation somehow disallowed and hers canonical? Thank you. Susan, you have a minute to rebut. My interpretation is not canonical, as we could see from, from this Republican primary campaign, which spent an incredible time talking about religion as justification for public policy. Now, Mr. D'Souza knows perfectly well that that, the, that lie in the Declaration of Independence is in line with natural rights theory. It didn't say those rights come only from God. And if the founders had wanted to say that the people had divine right, and the fact is that the Bill of Rights are among the best evidence that, that the founders did not mean the majority of the people to have the divine right. Because if they had, Catholics would never have survived in this country because they were a very small minority. Quakers would never have survived. All of the nonconformist Protestant religions would never have survived. The whole point of the federal constitution was to say, unlike the states, we are not going to give preference to one religion. They, they did not say we have, to have, we have to have all religions represented in our government. They made a separation. And of course, the phrase separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. The spirit is there. And it's just absolutely amazing that, that, that the Christian right says that people like me are saying that religious values have no place in the public square. I am saying, though, that they have no place as a justification for law. You have to show me that the death penalty does something we all want, which is discourages people from heinous acts. They have to do that before they can show that the death penalty is constitutional. But as far as quoting Paul and saying that, uh, that because all power comes from God, an a priori assumption, written at a time when everybody believed in some God, that therefore the state, and not just the state, Thank you. but majority should have it. Thank you very much. Okay, we now move to question two. How do you account for the close association on the right between political and religious conservatism, and on the left, between political and religious liberalism or secularism, or do you disagree that such an association exists? Susan, you have the first chance to respond. Four minutes. 
Yes, it does, it does exist in some measure. What's interesting about this association today is that it did not exist for most of American history. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, when William Jennings Bryan, uh, who was the great fundamentalist actually, that what he was really called was the great commoner, uh, people who were conservative religiously had liberal politics or populist politics economically. The, 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 the party, that is the Republican Party of the late 19th century was the opposite. They were economic conservatives and robber barons and many of them were social Darwinists, which is to say they believed that immigrants were inferior to native born Americans, of course that blacks were inferior to whites, that women were intellectually inferior to men. Uh, of course, probably, probably William Jennings Bryan believed some of that too. But the economic association between economic conservatism and Christian conservatism is very new in American history. One of the fascinating developments of the last 30 years, and it is a definite result of Roe versus Wade, is the, is the association between two historic enemies, right-wing evangelical Protestants, and by the I don't mean all evangelicals are right-wing, I mean that portion of evangelicals who are right-wing, and right-wing Roman Catholics, uh, who just hated each other for a long time, as we know from all, all electoral history before 1960. So that this association, while not absolute, I would say has come about largely as a result of Roe versus Wade. I don't even think the arguments over gay rights, which have the same uh, political alliance involved, were nearly as potent as that. I think it's a, it's a result of a specific time in history and a Supreme Court decision which has divided Americans by their religious beliefs very much. I do think that um, Historically, it is true that this association between political and religious conservatism on the one hand and liberalism on the other did not obtain exactly as Susan says. The reason that it obtains now uh, is because religious conservatives are in fact not the biblical literalists that Susan fears that they are. Uh, the truth of the matter is that if you are a biblical literalist and you read the Bible exactly for what it says, you are more likely to be a social conservative on social issues and an economic liberal. The Bible fulminates against the rich. And so if you take it literally, that's how you're going to come out. The truth of the matter is religious conservatives do not take the Bible literally across the board. They take the Bible literally in some respects, uh, and yet they read the economic passages in the Bible contextually. They say, listen, at a time when land, for example, was uh, the form of wealth, a property was a zero-sum game. If you had more, somebody else had less. Uh, the concept of economic growth didn't exist in ancient society. Uh, countries would go th hundreds of years without any fundamental change in their economic circumstances. But in societies that have property, contracts, mobility, when, where, where wealth is not in land but in money, those rules don't have to apply because the underlying premise is different. So in other words, we are dealing here with well, sincere people on both sides of the spectrum attempting to use, you may say, philosophical and theological analysis to make sense of what the Bible means. So my objection to Susan is not that the religious conservatives are right or the liberals are right, but she seems to think that there's a certain category of discourse that enjoys an elevated status. If you don't give, if you give religious justifications, as she puts it, you're somehow out of bounds. Well, what I ask you is, are the secular justifications themselves defensible on the basis of reason? When Obama says the rich are not paying their fair share, he never says what the fair share actually is. Should the rich pay 90%? Should they pay 70? Should they pay 50? What does he think is fair? When half, the, half of Americans pay no taxes at all, income taxes, he, that seems okay with him. And so no justification is ever given to explain what the fair share, what do you mean by the word fair? And is there any reasonable way to settle the issue? No. So if somebody else comes and says, I think that based upon my religious convictions, everybody should have just the same, or I think based on my religious convictions that everybody should pay proportional taxation, are their justifications somehow any less 
any uh, more uh, inappropriate in a democratic society, so they should be moved out of respectable discourse. They should not be listened to, because after all, they're quoting scripture instead of what Paul Krugman or Maureen Dowd in the New York Times. In other words, we all get our convictions from a complex set of preferences. And this applies as much to the pro-life issue as any other. I may think that I want to protect the unborn because I don't know if it's a human being or not. I just don't want to take the risk in the same way that if I'm a hunter and I see a movement in a bush, it could be a deer, but it could be another hunter. I don't want to shoot. Now, does that make me a religious fanatic? Does that make me a secular philosopher? I don't know. But the fact of the matter is whether I'm getting those convictions because of uh, being steeped in the Bible or whether I'm getting those convictions because I've been steeped in the writings of Thoreau, who cares? My argument stands on its own merits. No religious people are saying, because the Bible says this, Susan, you must believe it. What they're saying is because the Bible says it, I believe it. And I'm saying there's nothing undemocratic about that. Susan, you have a one-minute rebuttal. Yes. Mr. D'Souza is being quite disingenuous. He is not saying because the Bible says this, I believe it. He is saying because the Bible says this, this needs to be written into our law. That is quite different. And I understand why, an, uh, why a conservative intellectual like Mr. D'Souza is very disturbed by by religious fundamentalism, meaning a literal interpretation of the Bible. Because public opinion polls repeatedly show, and not by, not by crazed left-wing pollsters, but by the Pew Forum on religion and public life, that one-third of Americans, this is the only country in the developed world, one-third of the population believes that every word in the Bible is literally true. Now, it is very easy to see how when you, when you are a deeply religious person and you consider your sacred books a metaphor for spiritual tr truth, that can be used to accommodate to all sorts of secular knowledge. You can never accommodate a literal belief that the earth was created in six days, which again, a third of Americans believe, to the realities of modern science, period. Well, there always comes a point in the debate when there is a need for actual evidence. So here we have a claim by Susan Jacoby, I'm being disingenuous because what I really think uh, is that because the Bible says it, it ought to be the law of the land. Now here I am, I've written 11 books on just about every major topic from politics to social issues. So I think if Susan's gonna make a charge so severe, uh, then she should give quotes from my work which show that I'm actually arguing that my case, for example, against abortion relies exclusively on the Bible. I don't believe I've ever said anything even remotely resembling that. Even in my debates with atheists, I emphasize up front, I will never cite the Bible. I will never appeal to authority or sacred scripture. I'm going to argue solely on the basis of reason. If that's the way I'm arguing in front of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and, and, and uh, Daniel Dennett, it's a little ridiculous to then come around and, and pretend, oh, Dinesh, you simply believe because the Bible says it, therefore it should be law. Let me go even further and say that I don't even believe that morality comes out of the Bible. Morality comes out of conscience. I mean, when I read the Ten Commandments, I didn't go, hey, stealing is wrong. Wow, I didn't know that. Murder is wrong, unbelievable. I thought the opposite all my life. I already knew those things, we all did. The Bible is not a source of morality as much as it is a codification of a set of workable moral rules. So the point that we're getting at here is, and here I think we get to the core of a certain breed of atheism, it is united with ignorant fundamentalism in reading the Bible in the crudest, most literal way possible. It has no sophistication. It has ignored 200 years of biblical understanding, biblical commentary, uh, the progressive understanding of scripture that's come through the centuries. It reads the Bible exactly in the way as, as, a, as, as some sort of a, uh, a stand on the podium uh, pastor uh, who just says, this is what it says, therefore believe it, and that's the atheist critique. 
But that's not what most Christians believe. Thank you. We have to move on to question three. It would be considered uncontroversial to put up a statue or monument to Voltaire, Rousseau, or Thomas Paine on federal property or to state capital. Why should it be forbidden to put up a similar statue of Moses or Jesus, who may have had a far greater impact on our society and laws than the secular figures just mentioned? Dinesh, four minutes. Well, since it's my question, I find the logic of it impeccable. Um, in other words, in other words, this the question encapsulates the argument I've been trying to make. Namely, if we're talking, for example, about the U.S. Capitol, as you know, groups like the ACLU have always been suing and saying, let's take down the Ten Commandments. Here's the statue of Moses. Let's get it down. He's a religious figure. He doesn't really belong in the public square. So my question says, all right. Let's say somebody would have proposed putting up Tom Paine in the public square or Voltaire in the public square. Obviously, we would begin by debating the merits of having that particular statue, that particular symbol. What impact did Tom Paine have on America? Was it a greater impact than, say, Martin Luther King? Should we have somebody else instead? But never would it occur to someone to say that because of Tom Paine's anti-religious convictions, uh, he should be removed from the public square. No one would think to say automatically that Voltaire constitutionally is prohibited from being in the public square. We would want to debate whether we want to have the guy or no. On the other hand, if you put a religious proposal, and I mentioned Moses or Jesus, I think historically we would have to say that Moses and Jesus have done 20 times more to shape Western civilization, to shape American sensibilities, mores, law, culture, morality, uh, than, let's say, Voltaire. But nevertheless, people like the ACLU and perhaps Susan would be out there saying there's something inappropriate, there's something unconstitutional about this, this should be removed. And all I'm saying is that this is a shocking double standard that itself demands rational justification. You can't simply chant separation of church and state and declare the matter settled. What we're trying to figure out is why we have a prejudice against religious figures who have had an historical, moral, political, and even lawful impact, while we don't have that prejudice against secular figures similarly situated. So I'd like Susan to explain why the double standard. First, though, I'd like to point out that if the Ten Commandments really were, or their ideas in the Ten Commandments, really were the basis of American law, as the Christian right constantly asserts, and I'm not saying Mr. D'Souza. Mr. D'Souza is a Catholic. Catholics historically have not adhered to a literal interpretation of the Bible. But we wouldn't even be addressing this, this question if the full first commandment were supposed to be engraved in courthouses, because I will remind you, it prohibits the making of graven images of anything in the sky above or the earth below. I believe that would include Paine, Voltaire, and Rousseau, Moses and Jesus, not to mention cartoons of Muhammad. But the premise on which this question is based, that there would be no controversy over memorializing Thomas Paine in a public venue, is a perfect example of the ways in which those who wish to entangle religion with government try to make it look as if secularists are in charge of anything, everything. In fact, there's been nothing but controversy over Paine since he wrote The Age of Reason in 1793, in which all he did was advance the astonishing proposition that the sacred books of all religions were written by men. Uh, after George Washington, Paine at the time of the revolution was probably the best known man in America. Uh, Washington himself asked that Paine's crisis papers be read to the troops at Valley Forge in that terrible winter. But the age of reason ruined his reputation. Thomas Jefferson, the only one of his revolutionary colleagues who did not desert him, was strongly criticized for seeing Paine at the White House and bringing him home from France on an American ship. There is no statue of Paine in the US Capitol Sculpture Hall, although there is one of Brigham Young, although, in fact, it has been proposed many times. Uh, I'm omitting Rousseau and Voltaire because since they're French, it's unlikely that anyone would want to erect a memorial to them in a taxpayer-financed venue here. But as for Moses and Jesus, 
They simply do not belong on public ground financed by taxpayers because, simply because they are the founders of two of the world's great religions, which of course have contributed a great deal to our culture. But to say that they've contributed a great deal to the United States as a nation is true only in the sense that America, like all of the nations of Europe, is the heir of all Western culture. Moses' idea of governance was to break the first tablets when he saw those naughty Israeli tribes dancing around a golden calf. And there's another very practical reason why Moses and Jesus don't belong on publicly financed ground. You would quite rightly have every other religion demanding a statue of its mythic founder in compliance with the First Amendment. Why, as an atheist, I might want Christopher Hitchens, or if I were a politically right-wing atheist, Ayn Rand. I think they're certainly every bit as worthy as Brigham Young, though I definitely agree that Jesus and Moses are worthier in the story of Western culture. Thank you. Nash, one minute rebuttal. Wow. If you've been listening carefully, you'll notice that what Susan Jacoby just did was essentially a merit evaluation, thickly suffused with her own prejudices, of who should be in and who should be out. Oh, Thomas Paine, he was a third-rate philosopher, but you know what? He was really wildly popular around the time of the founding. I would give him a hearing, and I'm really surprised we don't have a statue of him up there right now. Uh, Voltaire, probably very deserving, but we Americans have prejudices against the French, so we'll leave that one aside. Uh, if we start with Jesus, where's it all going to stop? Let's back up. My point had nothing to do with any of this. It was not about debating the merits of A versus B. My point was that when it comes to secular figures, we can debate whether we want them or not. We can debate their merits, and we can have that discussion, and we can decide on the basis of what we think is a democratic society to include them or not to include them. Susan's view is that religious figures just don't merit that kind of evaluation at all. It's not that we weigh Jesus and Tom Paine and go, you know, on the balance, we think that Tom Paine weighs heavier in the scales. He actually had a more impact. She knows that would be ridiculous to say, so she doesn't say it. But my point is, she doesn't even want Jesus to be considered. She thinks that he should be disqualified before his name even comes up because there's something in the Constitution, i.e. in Susan Jacoby's own preferences, that basically say that religious people are out and secular people are in. So this is a stunning corroboration of what I've been saying from the beginning of this debate, that there's a built-in double standard hedged with some so-called qual... Of course, I'm not saying that religious people, blah, 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 but the fact is that is what she is saying. And it all really just comes down to the fact that she doesn't like Moses and Jesus, and she's in love with Tom Paine. <laughs> Susan, you have a minute rebuttal. Well, judging from what I know about Tom Paine's personal life, I don't think I would have been in love with him. Uh, but one, one of the things Mr. D'Souza is just ignoring is there is a reason why Moses and Jesus don't belong uh, as statues in the U.S. Capitol, why the Ten Commandments don't belong in our courthouses. And it is written in the First Amendment, which was intended to protect government, religion from government, but says explicitly, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the exercise thereof. And the, there is a very practical as well as a philosophical reason why the founders of great religions don't belong honored in a special place in our public buildings. And that is because we would have to honor every founder of every religion. And if you want to see controversy, I would like, to, I would like you to see the controversy if, if in fact, the, there were Joseph Smith were proposed for the U.S. Capitol, or for that matter, Muhammad, but you couldn't do that because we know how seriously they take the prohibition against graven images. But the idea that there would be no controversy about Thomas Paine is blatantly wrong because there has been controversy every time 
there was, there was a proposal to honor Thomas Paine. And I'm not saying that he was the most important figure in the revolution, or even that he necessarily should be in a capital. What I am saying, actually, is there should be debate about Thomas Paine. There should be no debate about Jesus and Moses, because the First Amendment prohibits your picking out the founders of two religions and honoring them with taxpayer money. We now come to the point in tonight's debate where the speakers can put a question to each other. Susan, you may put your first question to Dinesh, and Dinesh, you will have four minutes to respond. Uh, yes, uh, Dinesh, can you name any society in which church and state are legally joined that has a decent life for its people? Yes, um, Great Britain. Effectively joined. I, th I should have. Yes, there is an established church in Great Britain. That's true. Okay. So but, but it's a theocracy with no power. Well, you asked me to answer a question, uh, and I uh, thought I did. I, I'm, uh, I'm I, I can go further. I, I can sorry. go further. Uh, but, but to suggest that the Church of England is an established church with any real force is just not true. Well, it undercuts your point because you're implying that establishment inherently involves some sort of tyranny. Great Britain is a perfect example of a religious establishment with religious toleration, and it shows that there is no inherent contradiction in having establishment and toleration both. By the way, in most European countries, the governments give money to religious schools. Again, would anybody claim that decent life in Europe, that the, that the European countries somehow aren't tolerant of, of other religions? Nonsense. Europe is by and large more secular than the United States. So we have a certain hang-up on this subject, but the hang-up is not with the founders. The hang-up ultimately is with our contemporary way of reading that history in the most anti-religious way possible. Uh, do I get to, to respond? I forgot what the rules were. Please. Well, you uh, have four minutes, right? So you can uh, use it. Right. No, I'll use, I'll, use, I'll use two minutes. First of all, it has only taken, really, only, it took England, for instance, and France so long with their established churches to stop killing each other over religion. And that's what it was about, because they had an established church. The point, the point is that the reason the founders prohibited an established church was the horrible stuff that they saw in Western culture in the old world. If anyone thinks, and you can certainly, uh, you can certainly look at Islamic theocracies today, and, and I don't necessarily think that Islam is worse than Christianity. What is terrible for people is when the state abrogates to itself the power to determine their religious beliefs, and religion is also closely linked with government. And Mr. D'Souza earlier mentioned that, uh, that, uh, that, that during, let's say, the years of the Inquisition, the church tried you for heresy and the state tried you for murder. Actually, it was more to the point, the church tried you for heresy and the state, <coughs> the state executed the will of the church by carrying through with the murder. We still have a couple of minutes in this segment. Okay. Dinesh, did you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, sure. The, I agree that there were terrible battles in the early modern era, uh, uh, and they were battles in, that were clearly in part over religion. Uh, the Thirty Years' War had a strong religious component. But I also want to suggest that what we often miss is we see emerging at the same time new secular motives for killing people and for giving one's own life. Here's a perfect example. Most people think it's kind of fanatical to die for your religion, but they don't think it's fanatical to die for your country. That's considered kind of a good thing. Now let's think about that for a minute. Where does our country, our state, get that kind of demand, that kind of allegiance? It's a secular allegiance based on no God, I'm asking you to kill yourself for your country. So what we have done really is we haven't gotten rid of ultimate justifications, we've simply moved them from the religious domain to the secular domain where they are part of our belief and therefore invisible to us. We don't realize that the state is demanding exactly of us what the Inquisition demanded three or four hundred years ago. 
but we're invisible to that because we take it for granted. We are alert to the, con to the controversies of 300 years ago, and we look back and go, wow, we're so enlightened, we've avoided all those horrible, foolish people who went to their debts singing God save the queen or God save the king, but we go to our debts in Iraq and Afghanistan over pretty much secular motives. Um, and we are blind to that fact. So, what this teaches us is that there is no automatic reasonable position here. Ultimately, it comes to our deepest human attachments. We've moved from society where our deepest human attachments were explicitly religious to now a multiplicity of deep attachments. There are people who would die for love. Is that a reasonable position? Just because they're getting it from where? Inside of themselves? This is the way that I truly feel. The homosexual activist says, I don't know if it's nature, I don't know if it's nurture, but I know that it's me. Is that a reasonable position? Or is that simply an assertion of an inward feeling of constitutive identity? Why does that have an automatic place in the public square? Why isn't that disqualified? Because it fails to meet her scientific demonstrable test. There's no scientific evidence that could settle these issues one way or the other, be they abortion or gay marriage or taxes or war or justice or any other. These are all, we come to these issues with a complex mix of moral and religious and intuitive senses of what's right in a given situation. So what we're seeing here is an effort to isolate religion, demonize it, declare it in some sort of irrational category, when it's really not. It's part of the way that we as humans make sense of the world. And we have to bring that understanding to our private life, and we can't help but bring it to our public life. Thank you. Susan, you have a chance to rebut. Well, I, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, you know, who is we, Kimo Sabe? We do not all assume that it is, in, in, certainly not in all circumstances, a good thing to die for our country. And it is very true that we have gone to war in Iraq for, and in Afghanistan for secular reasons, although they're also entangled in some way with anti-Muslim feeling, which, which is a whole other subject. However, we are not dying for our country. Quite the opposite, we, I would guess the majority of people here tonight, whether we're secular or whether we are religious, we are willing to send others to die for our country. The smallest proportion of people in our history who have ever served in the army so that we, the relatively affluent upper middle class, can all be certain that it won't be the people we love who are dying for our country. Dinesh, you have now an opportunity to present a question to Susan. Susan, you'll have four minutes to answer. I want to ask you about the idea that the government cannot establish religion. And I want to ask you whether that means, A, that the government cannot declare a national religion. In other words, we can't be like Great Britain, an Anglican country. Or does it mean that the government can extend no preference to religion in any circumstances? If it means the latter, then I want to ask you this. If the government were to give a subsidy, let's say, to the farmers, is it establishing farming as our national occupation? Yes or no? Actually, it's establishing farming and supporting it in a way that's no longer merited in our economy, but it's not the same thing because the Constitution doesn't say anything prohibiting subsidies to farmers. You might think it is foolish to subsidize farmers, but there is nothing in the Constitution that prevents an unwise Congress or a wise Congress from doing it. There is something in the Constitution that prohibits establishing a single religion, or, or as is mostly the case in Europe now, 
providing money for several religions. Uh, Mr. D'Souza knows perfectly well that the first battle over religious subsidies was fought in Virginia in 1786, and it was the predecessor to the battles over the religious provisions of the Constitution. Patrick Henry wanted to put a property tax on people for the support of Christian schools, a coalition of free thinkers and Baptists. And the Baptists did not really care about the position of the free thinkers. I'm sure they didn't agree with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. What they did care about is that, that the money not go to the Episcopal Church, which would have been the established church in Virginia at that time. Our whole tradition prohibits supporting an establishment of religion. And and if, if what you are saying is the only prohibition is against favoring one religion or another, I would ask you, what would happen in this society if, if we were forced to look at every religion? Do we think it's good to subsidize a religion, for instance, that prevents the use of modern medicine, say Christian science? Uh, all of these things arise once you start giving support to religion. It would require absolutely equal treatment. Well, first of all, that's simply not true. A good example would be that our campuses, our states, and our federal government, for example, have all kinds of multicultural programs that are aimed, for example, at taking into account the contributions of different minority and racial and ethnic groups. Now, you could right away say, wait a minute, if we start down this road, where do we stop? Then you find some eccentric group and say, well, we have to fund these crazy people too. And the fact of the matter is, no. You don't always have to go all the way down the slippery slope. That's why we have a democratic debate. We make judgments about where we decide to draw the line. That's what we do with the farmers. We say, you know what? We're going to give the farmers a subsidy, but not so, but only up to this point. Or no, we're not going to subsidize travel agents, even though all of them or many of them have been put out of a job by the internet. So just because we subsidize the farmers, you can't say we're going to have to subsidize the travel agents. The fact of the matter is we can decide yes over here and no over there. Yes, we're going to have a statue of Moses, but no, we're going to have to say no, for example, to uh, Ali uh, or Buddha, uh, because their influence on American history has been much more uh, tangential. So uh, if it all comes down to the slippery slope argument, there are answers to that argument. But see, I think, and what seems clear, clearly emerging in this debate, that these are all fake arguments. This isn't your real reason. You're, you're saying there's a slippery slope pragmatic argument over here, and there's a better case for Tom Paine over there. But the old bottom line is that religion should be forbidden from the outset regardless of any arguments. Even if there were plenty of good arguments in favor of Jesus, you still don't want him in there. And your only reason is you keep chanting the same phrase from the Constitution when it is the meaning of that phrase that is up for discussion. My point about the farmers isn't that the farmers are, are in a different status than religion. religion. Of course they are. I'm asking what is the meaning of the word establishment? Is it the case that if you just recognize something, you're establishing it? Is it the case that if a state or, uh, or, or a locality decides, for example, that it's going to hire a Bible teacher, does this mean that America as a country has established Christianity? On the face of it, in any other area, this would be seen as ridiculous. But somehow in religion, we have become such anti-religious police that we have to monitor every public school to make sure that some third-rate guy isn't handing out Bibles to students even after school. We've got to get the Supreme Court to stop him. And this, to me, suggests anti-religious dementia. Anti-religious dementia justified by nothing other than mindless chanting of a phrase whose own meaning is open to discussion and debate. And Mr. D'Souza criticized me for calling him disingenuous. Really, I'm interested. I've never been accused of having anti-religious dementia before. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I guess this is a, a new diagnosis. Well, Susan, let's, let me press uh, you, if I may, if it's yeah. all right. You said that there is a slippery slope objection to having, let's say, the inclusion of religion. Let's say that there wasn't. Would you favor it? The, but the very reason it is well, not, the, no. Can you it is, it? It's a ridiculous question. It Almost, is? I would say, a religiously demented question. It's a, ridicu it's a ridiculous question 
because we are not allowed to make judgments about which religions to favor or not. It is so, but it, what the question is, why has religion become so unconfident of its ability to persuade by its teaching and moral example? These debates about, <laughs> these de I can assure you, I'm a Michigan girl. I grew up 150 miles away on the freeway in Lansing. I can absolutely assure you that there were no such debates, for example, about religion in public school. And I went to both public and Catholic school in the 1950s and the early 1960s. Everybody, like my Catholic parents, understood the teaching of religion to their children as their responsibility. No one expected that there would be classes about religion. No one was pressing to have prayers before football games. Everyone took for granted that the difference between a religious school and a public school was that the religious school was supported by religion and the public school was supported by all taxpayers. I do not think it is anti-religious dementia to think that was a good system. So it's okay to have beer before football games, and it's okay to have cheerleading before football games, and it's okay to throw the football at political rallies, but somehow when it comes to saying a prayer, that gets you all worked up. The point is not whether we should or shouldn't. The point is that somehow this offends you in a way that all kinds of other Philistine, barbaric, unimportant, frivolous activity is totally okay with you. That's all part of Americana, but somehow religion is in a different category. I guess this is what I'm trying to highlight. It's not that the Christian is asking for any special permissions. We're simply saying, why is it at every case that when it comes to religion, you take out your red marker and make a big circle around it? That, what is the meritorious argument for doing that now? Is it because 300 years ago uh, the Huguenots were at, at the throats of the Catholics? Is that your justification? You're worried that's going to start up right again here in Michigan? Is that the argument? Or rather, is it that those residual enlightenment anti-religious prejudices have somehow transmitted themselves to today? And even though the arguments, uh, the situation is different, you still echo those same prejudices in the name of a principle that we haven't yet clearly established. What does it mean to establish a religion? I agree, you can't do it. But I want to ask, what does it mean? What is being exactly forbidden here? That's the issue I think we need to consider. Thank you very much. Did you want to respond very yeah, briefly? Yeah, I just want to say I'm totally opposed to passing out beer to high school students before football games, too. <laughs> okay. But it's not against the Constitution, is it? No. Exactly. But it is against the law. <laughs> right. Well, now we've come to the section of the, of the debate um, where you have the opportunity to put questions to our debaters. We have two microphones at the end of each aisle. Please come on up, and uh, you will be called on. And we have two people who will assist as well. We have Joseph and then Jennifer, I think, will be assisting as well. Uh, I think, Ed, you are the first person who has made it to a microphone, so why don't we start with you? Oh, and I just want to say one thing for those who want to uh, ask questions. I'm going to invoke the Jeopardy rule. It means <laughs> put your statement in the form of a question. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Mr. D'Souza. Um, let me, I'll end by phrasing this as a question. I'll start by developing the premise of the question, uh, which is I found, I found your treatment of Jefferson and Payne, um, well, let's use the phrase that was used in this debate, disingenuous um, at best. You argued that Thomas Jefferson, because he invoked a creator in the Declaration of Independence, was therefore drawing on Christian tradition, and that proves uh, that the source of all of our rights is, is a religious source. And yet when you discuss Thomas Paine, all of a sudden, he was an anti-Christian, anti-religious person. And yet, Jefferson and Paine had almost identical views on virtually everything about religion. Thomas Paine was not an atheist. Thomas, or Thomas Paine was, in fact, a deist. And the first chapter of the Age of Reason he is largely devoted to him developing his What's religious beliefs. What's the question? So the question is, well, let me, let me phrase one more premise here, which is this. 
when you look at Jefferson, when you look at what Jefferson said, when you look at Jefferson, what Jefferson said about religion, and, and the, the subject of the debate is Christianity, not belief in God. Jefferson, when he looked at the Bible and at the Christian God, he called him cruel, capricious, vindictive, and unjust. He called the gospel writers a band of dupes and imposters. He called St. Paul the first corrupter of the doctrines of Jesus. So my, my question is, why do, you, why do you look at Thomas Jefferson and say his views represent the great Christian tradition, and Thomas Paine yet is this terrible enlightenment anti-religious person when their views were exactly alike? <laughs> well, there are two parts to this. I mean, certainly, I do think there were important differences between Jefferson and Paine. Uh, Paine's deism was more deeply entrenched. The, uh, the sort of the, uh, the, uh, the absentee God who put the world into motion and then went on long-term vacation. Jefferson had a much higher view of the moral teachings of Jesus. He thought Jesus to be, in a way, the perfect man. Not God, uh, not a miracle worker, but he thought that Jesus' spiritual insights were very deep. Now, when Christians today read the words of Jesus, uh, let's say the woman taken in adultery, for example, and so on and so on, the question is, should those precepts, which are as philosophically insightful as anything other major philosophers have laid forward, should those precepts be somehow, again, excluded from the legitimate debate of American politics. That's not what we're debating. The impact of Christianity, in this case Jesus, what would Jesus do, on American politics. So for example, Jesus creates a very high view of sin. In other words, if, if you even contemplated the sin, you've committed it. And yet, he's very gentle with the woman in adultery or the woman who had five husbands. So on the one hand, he's tough on the sin, but you might say gentle on the sinner. Now, let's just say there's a Christian outlook on politics adapted from Jesus that applies that idea to American politics. I'm saying, is that any less than an application of, let's say, some principle from Rousseau or Kant or Heidegger? Those are secular philosophers. Nobody would even argue if somebody said, let's discuss the ethical principles of Kant in, let's say, a public school. Nobody would object if a school teacher was handing out the metaphysics of morals uh, or the social contract. This wouldn't even be an issue. So my point is, why does suddenly this Jesus, whose impact, again, was much greater than the others, somehow suddenly qualify as the bad guy who should be left out. Is this actually what the founders were scared about? Is this what they were trying to protect against? Or do we have a tendentious reading of what they were trying to achieve? They were trying to prevent religious war. They were haunted by the memories of what had happened between the British and the French, the Inquisition, the persecutions. That's not an issue here. What's at issue here is that those fears are being harnessed politically today against what would seem to me a perfectly legitimate uh, application of very deep ethical principles to our political situation. So that's the difference between Jefferson, who I think would consider that application completely legitimate, and Paine, on the other hand, who probably would not. I, I just have a very short thing to say in answer to the last point about what's the problem with, with discussing Jesus in public schools as opposed to discussing Kant. Uh, you know, frankly, I, I don't think Kant has ever been discussed in a public school <laughs> below. You have a pretty elevated idea of public education. But I will tell you, uh, one, of, one of the things that, that I most, I was raised as a Catholic, and one of the things that I found most wrong about the Catholic Church, and, it, and it's not an interpretation that all Protestants have, is I think that the idea that to contemplate a sin, or as Jimmy Carter said, to lust in your heart, it, it is as if you had done those things, is one of would be utterly ridiculous as a blueprint for civil society. Because in fact, I don't care what any of you is contemplating right now. I only care about whether you actually do it. We do not have a law against contemplating murder or contemplating adultery. We do not even have penalties enacted by our husbands or wives for contemplating if they don't know about it. The difference between a thought and an action 
seems to me to be one of the most fundamental things wrong with Catholic theology. No, the point is not that I am right. It is that I would profoundly object to this being taught as any kind of a norm in a public school. Uh, I would object to a, a Catholic teacher teaching about Judaism, unless they'd had a lot of courses in comparative religion. I would object to, if I were a religious parent, I would object to an atheist interpreting religion in the way that I am. Religion is different. That is, the Constitution mentions it for a reason, because it's different. It goes to the heart of our thinking. You know, and and I, we simply can't have equal theology in our schools. Now, as a matter of fact, our law frequently does consider intention as being not only relevant, but completely decisive. Only when a crime has been already committed. Exactly. If I want to kill my wife, even if I fail, I can be prosecuted for murder because I intended the act. And the law acts as if the intention carries the same criminal penalty as my intent, as my actually trying to carry it out, even if I only wanted to do it. On the other hand, if I don't intend to kill somebody, but I do in fact kill them, the law treats that completely differently. Even though we got a dead guy on our hands, it's not murder, it's an accident. So right away, we see here how and I would argue that this principle of Jesus is in fact embedded in our law. And Susan is actually okay with it because she accepts the result of our law. She's simply ignorant of the genesis of the law. And therefore she states as a, de as a declarative principle, the law never considers intentions. Muslim law doesn't. In Muslim law, they don't care if you're modest as long as you wear the veil. But we would say that if the law makes you wear the veil, you're not modest because it's forcing you. It's only if you choose to wear the veil that you have, you can be eligible to be considered modest. So this is an embedded part of Western morality, and Jesus' principle is thoroughly in the mainstream of Western moral and even legal discourse. No, it, no, it's not. Intention is only considered in determining the penalty for a crime that has occurred. No one has any way of knowing whether you want to kill your wife unless you actually try to do it. And yes, we do. We do have a penalty for attempted murder, which is a crime because you've attempted the murder, not because you thought about it. All right. But second. Okay. Second question. Let's move on. I, uh, I thought you were, I think you were partly onto something with the divine right of kings versus the divine right of people, but then you got about 25% of the way there and I think you went off course. The Declaration of Independence was a manifesto. It was an explanation to the Western world why the, U, why the Americans were throwing off their lawful ruler when all the other Western countries viewed the divine right of kings as the inherent natural order of things. And to me, I think Jefferson was using language and wording that he knew would play, that, they, that he had to give these people an excuse and it, and it couldn't be the divine right of king so subtly in the way you interpret it, it was kind of the divine right of people to a certain extent. But I don't think the Declaration of Independence should be taken in any way, shape, or form as a way of saying, okay, because I put the word create in there, we now can establish religion in our secular society with a secular constitution. So I, I, think, you, I think you had a point in there, but I think you diverted at that point. So but you can both comment and I'll sit down. Please. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll leave that one. I, I generally agree with you, but it wasn't really a question, so I'm not going to take up our time because there's so many people waiting. I'm okay with passing also. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I attended Okemos High School three years after you, and oh, I have really? written you about this, that um, in the intervening time, the Supreme Court ruled about prayer in the public school. And I was forced to sit in a room with one other person because I did not want a prayer at our Honor Society uh, induction service. And the school board decided that the way to respect my rights was to let me choose to not be there and to be singled out separate from the other kids. And I wonder what you think the appropriate school board decision would have been in those circumstances at Okemos High School. 
I never liked the Okema School Board, I can tell you this, this did. In fact, her example is an example of how things changed over time. It was the beginning of a movement for religious conservatives and parents would have, parents would have gone absolutely crazy if that had been done when I was there. There was a big difference. And I think this happened in Okemos because of, a, again, reaction to late 60s, early 70s, you know, part of a general, which is too general for this discussion discussion about a breakdown. 1963-64 is yeah, when it after, happened. Yeah, after I graduated, about, about a breakdown of order. But that, one of the whole things about religious ceremonies in schools is everybody who's religious acts as if this is no problem for the non-religious, or it, it's no problem for the two or three Jews in a school, which really was the case in Okemos back when I was there, as opposed to the Christians. Uh, but again, I don't, think th I don't think that's good school board policy. My mother, certainly, if I'd still been in school, would have been right on the barricades opposing it. Uh, however, this is an example of the dangers of bringing religious ceremonies into public schools. It's bound to leave somebody out. And, and after all, the, the whole thing I have never understood about this is anybody who wants to reflect and pray by themselves within a group can do it. It's what the Quakers call the inner light. I've always thought that was a lovely idea. What this is about is compelling a public statement. I think that I don't feel strongly about the issue of school prayer, but I do think it's interesting that as students sitting in a classroom, whether it's in public schools or in state colleges, people are all the time exposed to ideas and even propaganda that they don't like, they don't agree with, that makes them feel extremely uncomfortable. I think it's not an exaggeration to say that pretty much every conservative student who is sitting in a liberal classroom at a state university is bombarded. And I'm just not just talking about some simple ceremony. I'm saying in classroom after classroom with a diversity propaganda that makes them extremely uncomfortable, makes them feel extremely out of place, unwelcome, and so on. But the fact of the matter is this is not treated as some sort of a constitutional right to say to the school, you have no business doing this. You have to exempt me from this. You have to rewrite all your laws because I, as a conservative, feel uncomfortable with all this stuff you're saying. All I'm trying to say is that in every other subject, this kind of propaganda is going on all the time, and we're taking it, and you know, we have no choice but to take it. But suddenly somebody says, oh, you know, I'm a Hindu, and because they mentioned the phrase under God, and I have a different view of God, I'm extremely uncomfortable. Stop doing that. So in other words, you may say that the, the wishes of the other 85% or whatever are trumped by my discomfort. And all I'm saying is, in no other area do we enforce that orthodoxy. In no other area do we allow some guy to say, I just don't like the fact that in my school they're always talking so much about about uh, uh, creating racial and ethnic diversity and all this other stuff. They're doing that all day. They have residential advisors that bombard me on the weekend. My professors do it in class. This is not a matter of something symbolic. It's going on all the time. What provision is made for my rights? Shouldn't they stop all this so I don't feel uncomfortable? The answer is, in, a, in an educational setting, no, they shouldn't. Even as a conservative, I say, no, they shouldn't, because there is nothing wrong in an educational setting, even with being exposed to ideas that make you uncomfortable. That's kind of the job of education, to make you a little uncomfortable. And you're going to be uncomfortable when you're exposed to Socrates' dialogues. You're going to be uncomfortable when you're subjected to Hume, as I was. You're going to be uncomfortable when you're subjected to other religions. There's no automatic evil posed by religion that puts it in a different category. That's the point. Mr. D'Souza is ignoring the fact, it is ironic, uh, he's making the case for how important religion is in a way as if it is just another thing. All of those professors who say all the time things one doesn't like or doesn't agree with, they are not saying that this is the word of God. It is not a ceremony believed to be agreed to by 85% of the people. 
what the Constitution, I'm sorry you hate that banal word, says is that we 85% of the people don't decide. And I don't know that 85% of the people in Okemos wanted prayer. But I do know that once you say, this is the word of God, it falls in an entirely different category than all of the idiotic things that we've all heard in colleges. Hey. Thank you. Moving on. Next question, please. To Mr. D'Souza, you brought up the logical fallacy of the slippery slope argument when talking about uh, imagery of religious figures. Uh, concerning that you brought up that fallacy so clearly, I wonder what your response is to the religious right in general when it comes to the slippery slope argument within uh, social and liberal justices. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Can you, can you clarify what you mean? Uh, the slippery slope argument is frequently used to argue against civil liberties uh, and equality in general. I was wondering, since you brought it up as a, a logical fallacy when it comes to imagery of religious figures, what your response was uh, when it comes to it being used uh, to counteract arguments for civil liberties? Oh, I see. Well. Slippery slope arguments are not inherently valid or invalid. What they describe is a tendency. What they basically say is once you go here, there's going to be an automatic weight to go there. And the question becomes, when is that in fact the case? So somebody could say, for example, that if you raise the, the taxes of the rich from 35%, the current level, to 40, let's say, that it will automatically go to 45 and 50 and 60 and 70. And I would say, no. To me, that's not a slippery slope. At every case, we can calibrate where we want the taxes of the affluent to be. So it's not that the slippery slope isn't valid. It just doesn't really apply in this particular case. So all I was saying is that if we were to say in a society that we're going to, just as in a society we say when it comes to race, let's acknowledge, for example, in our textbooks, the blacks, the Hispanics, the Asian Americans. And so in a typical textbook, you'll see all those guys. Now, you won't see a whole bunch of other guys. Why? Because there just aren't so many of them in America. They're not represented because they don't have a big constituency over here. So we're, 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 we're basically drawing a line. We're saying, let's take the major ethnic groups that are right over here and give them some acknowledgement. We're not going to focus so much on these guys because we just don't have a lot of them over here. We're making a prudential judgment call about which groups are going to be represented. Now, can you do that with, with sort of perfect justice? You can't. So, but my point is, again, we do it with race, but we somehow think we can't do it with religion. Why not? Just as we have Hispanics, Asians, whites, and blacks, we have Protestants, we have Catholics, we have Jews, we have Hindus. Why can't we make a similar accommodation and say, when it comes to the public square, when it comes to being featured in textbooks, when it comes to distributing literature, that look, uh, just as Susan Jacoby is free to stand in a public school as, let's say, as, and hand out copies of, of, of Tom Paine, some other guy is perfectly free to stand right across from her and hand out copies of the Old Testament if he wants. There's no slippery slope here that is going to automatically say, hey, you're doing that. How come we aren't handing out the Book of Mormon? How come we aren't handing out the Bhagavad Gita? If guys want to do that, we'll consider that too. But there's no automatic slope that prohibits you from getting down that road in the first place. That's what I'm saying. Intelligent people can decide where to draw lines, and we do it all the time. Uh, we, do, we don't really do it about religion very much, but I, I would suspect, uh, not, not distributing Thomas Paine, but I would suspect if I were, for example, to distribute some pamphlets with extracts from Richard Dawkins in a public school, I, I suspect some principal would stop me. There is a perfectly simple answer to this. Anybody who wants to distribute religious or anti-religious pamphlets can go across the street. Uh, if the students want them, they can get them. There's no reason I have to put an atheist pamphlet down anybody's throat. No reason somebody has to put Jewish or Christian literature down anybody's throat. This is a special business in our society, and it has worked so well for both religion and government. 
the public square is everywhere, but it's not in specific places that are supported by taxpayers for what used to be called common schools. Susan, may I ask you a question? You said that it, it, it wouldn't be a good reason to hand out, let's say, Richard Dawkins' pamphlets on a public school, but would it be constitutionally prohibited? No, but it would be, it would be practically okay. prohibited. It, okay. But because the so, Constitution doesn't say anything about Richard Dawkins, okay. it says something about religion. Right, you keep so, ignoring that. All right, so we're back again. We're back again. To that pesky Constitution. Not That's to the right. pesky Constitution. <laughs> We're back again. We're back again to your idea, which you've never defended for one moment in this debate on the merits, that there is something dangerous, for example, about distributing, let's say, the confessions of Augustine or the works of the early church fathers. That's religious. The founders were really scared of that stuff. But had the founders been acquainted with the enlightened works, works of Richard Dawkins, they would consider that to be perfectly legitimate stuff to be handed out, completely legal, perfectly constitutional. Religious stuff, no. Anti-religious stuff, yes. All I'm trying to say, Susan, is that it looks to me that this is a very tendentious interpretation of the Constitution that very conveniently benefits your own anti-religious convictions. You have declared that the Constitution means that anybody who doesn't agree with you is illegal is outside the bounds, but all your views, while they might be imprudent to actually be handed out, are perfectly constitutional and perfectly legal. And all I'm saying is, you have never given a single argument for the merits of that view, nor have you really shown that there's some act of reason that automatically compels us to read the Constitution in that way. Well, there, there is reason. There is plain English that says, that Congress shall pass no law respecting or prohibiting establishment of religion. The reasons for that then are just as good as they are today. Have we not seen enough of what religion, given preference by the state, can do, even in our own time? And don't tell me, well, that doesn't apply to Christianity anymore. That doesn't apply to Judaism. The reason this prohibition is in the Constitution is because, not because the founders were anti-religious, it's because they recognized the power of religion. And the power of religion, when it's united with government, is always dangerous, yes. I do believe that. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Sir. Um, I think that an underlying issue that hasn't been stated explicitly is that uh, the ideas and propositions of any given religion are um, exclude others in a way that secular ideas and propositions don't. Like you're a member of a particular religious group in a way that you aren't a member of secular secularism. So would you not at least agree that uh, perhaps secular ideas are more appropriate for the public sphere because they are accessible to religious people in a way that religious ideas are not accessible to those who are not religious? I would absolutely reject that distinction. I don't think that there is anything inherent to religious ideas that makes them unacceptable to secular people. Secular people just decide to reject them. You listen to them and you decide, the pastor says, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, no. That's no different than somebody standing up and saying, don't vote for Obama, and you say, I'm going to. Or somebody says, I'm a conservative, and you say, no, I'm a liberal. There's no inherent tendency in one or the other. Now, you might say, well, religions have claimed that they are the exclusive path to salvation and so on. But the truth of the matter is, even if that's true, we'll never know until we're dead. The religious claims that are made in politics apply to this world, right? There's an attempt to translate religious ideas into something like the just war theory, which, which has certain propositions. Don't attack first. If somebody from another tribe comes and kills 10 guys in your tribe, you can't go and kill 10,000 guys in his tribe. That's disproportionate. Now that's, again, an interpretation of a religious principle and applied to setting moral standards in war. This is a perfect example of moral standards basically that come out of the just war tradition in Christianity that are followed by the U.S. military even right now. The U.S. military has to consider issues of proportionality, collateral damage, when it's carrying out its operations. Notice in other cultures these debates don't even come up. So all I'm trying to say is that these Christian principles 
are not only accepted, even secular people go along with them. If we bomb cities without indiscriminately, there'd be secular outrage over that. Even though that principle that you shouldn't bomb the non-combatants in war comes out of the Christian just war tradition. So, again, I don't see anything particularly qualifying or disqualifying. Seems to me with every principle, you got to look at the merits and weigh it. And that's no different for religious principles as for any other. They can be measured and weighed in exactly the same way. I'm departing from the debate a little bit because I agree with 90% of what Mr. D'Souza said. The only point I want to make is he is perfectly right. You have just as much right to say no to uh, Archbishop Timothy Dolan as you do to Richard Dawkins. The reason you have the right to say no to Archbishop Timothy Dolan, however, is the kind of society, the norms that were written into our laws. There was so much, I don't see how he can just dismiss so much of human history as that's past. The essence of governments providing preference for religion is that you don't have the right to say no. The reason we have the right to say no to any form of thought, secular or religion, are, is the freedom of conscience that is, and I know that phrase isn't used in the Constitution either, is part of the norms that were set up when our country was established, not as a Christian nation, but as a nation for all religions or no religion. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Hello. Um, I, had, uh, I, I feel really concerned uh, in listening to this debate tonight. Um, I'm concerned about both uh, religion and politics. Uh, most of us here have gone through one form of indoctrination or another, whether it be a religious indoctrination or indoctrination into the government and becoming a, a good citizen, and it both start, you know, get them while they're young. It's, you know, political and religious. And uh, the core of the statist religion uh, is basically the idea of the social contract. And I feel this is, uh, to be able to even talk about things, you have to discuss the, the definitions. And when you talk about a social contract, um, it's not actually a contract. It's, there is no contract there in, in a social, it's this, it's this idea of a myth, or this mythological idea, and it's something I feel that needs to really be uh, questioned. And I wonder if um, both you guys and the audience here would be willing to question these deeply held beliefs, whether religious or political ideas, um, we can be good to each other without having force, and there's a lot of force involved in government, and there's uh, a lot of problems uh, in, in both government and politics. So, Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, I really don't understand the question. <laughs> I guess my question was, how do you feel about the idea of a social contract? Because you, you mentioned the social contract uh, a couple of times, and why is this such a deeply held belief? It's as deeply held as a religion. Well, I, if you're I, willing to question I, uh, religious social ideas. Con so, uh, okay, I, I think I understand. Well, I think that you could say social contract is certainly more implicit than explicit. And I think you could say that one of the problems in our society, and this is a problem that goes beyond politics, it goes beyond religion, is that there, that there is a lot of evidence in my view, and it's really too much to, to go into a detail now, that our social contract is, is breaking down in a lot of areas. And I think uh, this is one thing in which I would agree with certain religious people, that there are a lot of there are a lot of values which are part of the social contract, which certainly includes things from religious as well as secular tradition, which increasingly I don't know whether they're held. It's hard to tell. I think th that this is a real problem, but it's almost beyond the scope of this debate. I yeah, think. I feel that the problem with both religious and political ideals are the ideas of, of this collectivism without recognize, recognizing the, the individual. Right. Well, we're individuals, but we also belong to groups. And the way I look at it is that, are we going to have a discriminatory principle entrenched in our law 
that singles out the religious groups and subjects them to second-class citizenship. Here's an example, a very practical one. Let's say you have, for example, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and you have all kinds of student clubs. Uh, the gays have a club. The conservatives have a club where they read, let's say, Adam Smith. The liberals have a club where they read, let's say, Obama or Keynes. Now, a group of Christians say, we want to have a club that's going to read the Bible and study it. All the other clubs get recognition and money. We want some too. Where now, does that money come from, though? Hold that's, on a second. That's what I'm the money comes from the activities fees paid by students. Now, remember, it's going to a lot of groups that other students may not approve of, but nevertheless, they're part of the diversity of the campus. According to Susan, the founders were so scared that they would tell the University of Michigan regents, give all the other clubs money, but forbid the Bible group, because after all, you guys can meet privately and be biblical. Well, you can be, meet privately and be gay. You can meet privately and be conservative. You can meet, meet privately and do everything else that's being done, but the, the, but the campus is recognizing it and subsidizing it, recognizing it to be part of the diversity of the campus. But when it comes to Christianity, a special exception has to be made because there were religious wars that really scared people like Thomas Jefferson. Let's talk sense. We're all citizens of this society. We have equal religious freedom and equal rights. Why is it the case that one group of citizens gets turned away for doing what it wants and promoting its ideas and discussing them, and other groups are getting funded, recognized, and subsidized? What is the reason for that? Mr. D'Souza is absolutely wrong. Mr. D'Souza is completely wrong. Every campus on this country, in this country, as far as I know, subsidizes groups, They're, they provide meeting halls and so on, uh, like the Campus Crusade for Christ, like Hill House, Michigan State is the university I know the most about because that's where I went. It is, has always been part of the University Student Activities Fund. I don't think that's any different now. They also subsidize Buddhist groups and Hindu groups. I don't know where his evidence, this has not been any campus that I have ever been on that religious groups aren't subsidized to the extent that they're subsidized, that all groups are subsidized as, as simply a part of student life. He's well, wrong. I could give an example. Of, I could give an example. I just spoke a couple of weeks ago at Vanderbilt University, and the university has declared that, as a matter of policy, that you can have Christian groups, but they can't actually require that their leadership be Christian. Now, if again you think about it, for any other group, this would be considered obvious. If you're going to run the college Republicans and you want to be the head of it, you kind of need to be a Republican. This, this wouldn't even be debated. Uh, and it's true of every other group. Uh, the Black Student Association could easily say, we have these criteria for leadership, you've got to read Martin Luther King or, or this or that, and this would be uncontroversial. But again, for the Christian groups, a special burden is placed on them that they're not allowed to discriminate in what way? By excluding others? No, no one's excluded from membership. They're just, they just say that if you're going to be, let's say, the head of the Calvinist group on campus, you got to subscribe to Calvinist beliefs. And again, what I'm trying to show is in case after case, the rule of common sense and the rule of non-discrimination, that if we have worked so hard as a country to include everybody and not discriminate, Somehow now, this constitutional provision allows us to make a big exception to the non-discrimination rule. Thou shalt not discriminate except when it comes to those religious people. The Constitution really didn't like them and put them in a special category. And all I'm saying is, that's a that is a discrimination too far, uh, and we need to take a hard look at that. Again, Very brief. just not true. Uh, the fact is, is that at nearly all universities, the truth is, is that everybody who belongs to a Christian group is Christian. Everybody who belongs to the Black Student Union is black. But most universities have made it very clear that they can't actually exclude people of other groups. It has to do precisely with what Mr. D'Souza says doesn't happen. It has to do with university subsidy, with the spending of public funds, taxpayer-supported universities for groups that discriminate. Now, obviously, the Black Student Union is going to be mostly black. Uh, Christian groups are going to be Christian, Jewish groups are going to be Jewish, and everybody knows it. But you can't formally cut people out. Is this true, as far as I know, on every campus I've ever been? Susan, may I ask you now, what's odd is you, 
You've defended a principle that seems to me contrary to everything you've been arguing here tonight. You've said that the word establishment in the Constitution should be read so broadly that there is a special prohibition of establishing religion. But now I've given examples of campuses that are funding religious groups, and you say, well, that's okay. Aren't they establishing religion? Aren't, shouldn't you be fighting against the fact that there's a Catholic student center here that gets college money or a Protestant group there? Aren't they violating the Constitution according to your own logic? Uh, I, I, I would be. If you, if you were to press me to the wall, I would probably say that it's a bad idea. But in reality, I think given the nature, of, the nature of state universities and the broad need of students to identify with their own groups, but what I would say would be absolutely wrong, you do put yourself open to, and this has happened on a lot of campuses, every little religion now has its own group too. That is, that's the practical reason for not doing right, it. Right, but we're not talking about whether it's a bad idea. My question to you is, you think that that's unconstitutional. It's not yeah. a bad idea. You think that it should be stopped. It should be forbidden because the Constitution, in using the word establishment, does not allow campuses, schools, any institution, even to accommodate religious views, even though it's accommodating a hundred of other, other types of beliefs, interests, and convictions. This is completely different from the earlier issues we were talking about, like school prayer in public elementary and high schools, because these are voluntary associations. It is not at all the same thing as if a professor which they don't do at religious universities either, by the way, were to go up to the head of the class and say, now we'll begin, begin this class with a prayer. Uh, it's quite different, voluntary associations, and the imposition of one religion, or two religions, or three religions on all of the students in an institution. Uh, yes, I know. I know that there are lots of lots of graduation ceremonies that have pastors and rabbis speak. As far as I'm concerned, that should be limited to religious universities. Okay, thank you very much. Last question. You did a great job for an introduction to my question. Going back to Harvard in the 1600s when Harvard was established, um, they used a scripture verse, John. 17.3, and that was to lay Jesus Christ at the bottom of all sound knowledge and learning. And today we know Harvard's motto as veritas, which means truth. There was a part of um, that motto that got broken off, and it was truth for Christ in his church. So how do we address, to me that gives us a hint as to where our founding fathers started their, um, got their education and started um, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So how do we address the early institutions of education um, to where we are today? Do we just ignore what the goals were of those early institutions? And this is for both of you to answer that. Thank you. All I'd like to point out is, is that Harvard is still a private university, but when it was founded in the 17th century, it was a private university founded by a church. We actually no longer have universities which don't receive huge amounts of federal funds. That is another, that is another discussion about government money for private institutions. But I don't think, to, to, say, that, to say that because Harvard was founded by uh, Calvinists, that it ought to be Calvinist today, or it certainly ought to have something about Jesus in it. I'm reminded of, you, but the thing is, is this isn't recent. Uh, one of the greatest correspondences in American history is the correspondence between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. John Adams, of course, went to Harvard, but when it was already becoming less of a religious institution, and there, there's this beautiful thing in this letter which Adams wrote to Jefferson at a time when he was very angry because Jews still weren't allowed to run for office in Massachusetts, and he said, People might say that to, and religion, he, this followed a long passage about how disgusted he was by the sectarian strife in Massachusetts at the time. So wrote to Jefferson, people might say that two and two make five, but you and I should know the difference. We should know it would make four. I, 
interpret your question a little differently. I think what you're saying is that we have become, we've developed an amnesia about the intellectual and moral and even the religious climate in which this country was founded. We project our own radical secularism back into time and take the most anti-religious sayings of a Jefferson and highlight those, not recognizing that for all their disagreements, the founders actually had implicit common ground. Notice when you have implicit common ground, you don't debate it. We could have a whole debate about civil rights without once discussing are blacks and whites intrinsically equal. Why not? Because there's a presumed moral agreement on that subject. So the fact that we don't bring it up doesn't mean we don't believe it. We might be debating affirmative action, but nevertheless, that is a very important common understanding. And there was a common understanding among the founders that our rights come from nature and nature's God. Now, what they, the reason they use the word nature is they believed that God doesn't proclaim these rights by revelation, thunderbolts from heaven. God has embodied this understanding of divine law in conscience and in the observation of the world. We can see, for example, that human nature is a certain way, and we can derive moral principles. So you don't actually need revelation to discover nature's God. You simply need a moral awareness of what nature is telling you. And this, by the way, has a tradition that goes back to the Socratics. The idea Socrates spoke of natural right, the idea that you can excavate right from nature. But again, when pressed, even Plato put a divine foundation on that in the Timaeus. So, what I take you to be saying is, listen, there's something a little crude historically in taking the fact that we're living today in secular society and pretending like that's the way it always was. Now, we might say we don't like the founders, we don't like what they did, we believe in the living constitution. What's interesting about Susan is that she hasn't said any of that. She's not saying the constitution's meaning is not fixed and when they said establishment, they mean A, but we mean B. I think that's what she actually is arguing. But she's saying, no, they meant, they meant the same thing that I meant. And I think that you, looking across the yawning gulf of 200 years of history, we can intuit that that's not the case. That Thomas Jefferson's moral universe, very different than the moral universe of Susan Jacoby. And his understanding of establishment, of separation. Look at the, when, when Jefferson came with a really painful issue, slavery. Notice how his language goes totally religious. And can the liberties of a nation be secure? And can we violate them except with his wrath? Suddenly, Jefferson, the secular guy, when he's fulminating against slavery, he needs the religious language. That's the moral vocabulary that does justice to what slavery is. And this is a guy who has slaves. So again, there are paradoxes in Jefferson, but we have ironed them out and created, I think, a bogus idea of who these founders were. So that I take to be the profound core of your question, which I want to second and affirm. And I would say that Thomas Jefferson's religious anti-slavery co uh, comments show the great limits of religion in dealing with moral issues. All right, well, thank you for spirited questions and answers. And now we move to the very final part of this evening's program. Dinesh D'Souza has a two-minute period in which to give a closing debate statement. Here we are flung into the world as humans, and there are many questions that we don't know the answer to. Why is there a universe? Um, What's going to happen to us after we die? Uh, is there a purpose to it all? These are the deep questions that religion attempts to grapple with. I want to emphasize that these are in some ways empirical questions. Either there is life after death or there isn't. But there's no way this side of eternity to know what the correct empirical answer is. We live in doubt. That's why we're believers. We're not knowers. We're believers, and we're called to have faith because we don't know. So there is a skepticism built in religion also. Now, here's the point. You can say that our democratic debate is based on reason, but there is no reasonable way to resolve these fundamental questions. 
There's no reasonable way to declare in advance there is life after death or there isn't. We live in eternal skepticism about that. And so the, the claims of religion are not amenable to easy scientific resolution. You can't do an empirical experiment and sort it out. Now what Susan Jacoby is doing is taking this great, deep, and complex thing, religion, which gives answers, and maybe wrong answers, but nevertheless, it's tackling questions that science doesn't even dare to deal with and wouldn't even know how to begin to deal with. What's the scientific answer to is there life after death? Don't have a clue. What's the scientific answer to is there a purpose to life? Don't have a clue. What's the scientific answer to why there is a universe? Don't have a clue. So the religious questions bear upon us. We can't avoid dealing with them and taking a stance on them, whether it's for religion or against it. Now, here's my point. Whatever stance we take, believer or unbeliever, what is the justification of the secular state showing up and saying, listen, there are two types of answers, religious answers and secular answers. We declare that the secular answers are wonderful, deserve constitutional protection, recognition, sub subsidy, encouragement, but these religious answers are basically dogmatic, superstitious, extremely dangerous, lead to religious wars, and they've got to be stopped and prohibited. On the face of it, this is idiocy. We are all humans struggling with these questions, and society has got to recognize that the answers to these are not known in advance, and at the least, we should be modest and step back and say, listen, we are at least all equal citizens, we have equal rights, we have the, the right to be treated in a non-discriminatory way, and the claims of religion do not deserve special antagonism, special prejudice, and special exclusion. That would take the majority of American citizens and make them second-class citizens in the name of a constitutional sleight of hand, very remote, from anything that the American founders ever imagined. If they were to see what the ACLU has done with their constitution, these guys would be spinning in their grave. Thank you very much. <laughs>
is why Christianity, a particular kind of very conservative Christianity, has become so much more politicized than it was even 60 years ago. And the answer, I think, can be found in the fear of these particular Christians that they're losing ground in the free religious marketplace, a phrase only in America, by the way, that's used, particularly among the young. If you're a Catholic bishop who can't convince, convince your flock of the rightness of your position on contraception or homosexuality, you claim the right to spend public money only according to doctrines that aren't even accepted by the majority of your communicants. If you're not confident of your ability as parents to communicate religious principles to your children, you try to get tax money to be spent on religious schools. Can you imagine what a cry of outrage there would be if an atheist organization applied for public money for a charter school to teach children that God is a fairy tale? And it would be a justified cry of outrage because the purpose of public funding for schools is trans to transmit the sum of human knowledge generally accepted by scholars and scientists and historians, not to filter that knowledge through religious or anti-religious views. As I mentioned, when I was growing up in Lansing, there was just no controversy about prayer in public school because the difference between Catholic and public school was in Catholic school we spent about a fourth of the day in prayers and in mass. Uh, and there were no conservative Christians demanding that hymns be played before the football games at my high school, beer either. Why? Because quite properly, in the spirit that's prevailed since the early days of the Republic, parents considered teaching children religion, their business, and their responsibility. I believe that the real reason right-wing Christians, and I am not saying Christians, I'm saying Christians who are particularly influential and aggressive, not just in the public square, but in the halls of our legislative bodies, the real reason they're aggressively trying to write their dogmas into laws, schools, and other public institutions is that they have lost their confidence in their ability to convince solely by force of moral example. That is the liberty our government grants every form of religion and every form of secular thought. That much and no more. This is real American exceptionalism in which we can all take pride. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for attending tonight. My name is Joseph Corey. I'm representing the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. I'm a program officer. Sorry. Um, firstly, I'd like to say it's really a pleasure to, to be in Grand Rapids. I'm here, like I said, on behalf of ISI. And while I work in Wilmington, Delaware, I'm a nat native, and I was born and raised in Rochester, Michigan. So it's good to be close to home. And secondly, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Inquiry and the Howenstein Center for helping us to arrange this event tonight. It's really been a great debate and a successful evening. And it's with groups such as these that ISI has been educating for liberty since 1953. Through student reading groups, lectures, and debates such as these, we seek to educate students and citizens in those virtues and principles that make America free and prosperous. If you're interested in learning more about ISI, please see me after the debate. I'll be on the table just out there. Take some of our free literature. I don't want to take it home with me. Thanks. <laughs> I would also encourage you to fill out, fill out one of our free membership cards. Uh, you'll get our quarterly uh, for free, and it's a great way to learn about more ideas such as these. And with that, I would like to ask our co-sponsors, representatives from our co-sponsors, to join me on stage to present Dinesh and Susan with a gift to show our, uh, uh, as an appreciation, uh, token of our appreciation. So thank you again. up here, then you're going to be off the train. Okay, I would like to say thank you very much for a very spirited debate, and on behalf of the sponsors, the co-sponsors, I'd like to present with you with a Ralph Howenstein signature wow. tote bag. There's yours. Thank you. I need this. Yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. We hope you come back to Grand Rapids. Thank I've you. been here a lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, thank you. 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 Th